powerful, powerful message in that song. Uh, something that we've seen over and over again. People falling away from God. Falling off of treacherous cliffs of pride. And, and not resurrecting from such graves. And it really should behoove us all to ask, is it, is it I that would betray you? <clears throat> Just thought of that song. I was kind of, kind of trying to think if there would be a song that ties in with what what I want to talk about in the opening this morning. I couldn't think of one, but that one gets real close. Um, I don't thank you whoever picked it. <laughs> um, well, let's pray. Um, are there any prayer requests this morning? Yeah, I, I had thought he was in the area. I was hoping to see him this morning, so we'll pray. Pray for him. Okay. One way or another, they're not in the area yet, I guess. So, pray for their safety. Um, well, let's not forget Daniel in Bangladesh and the work that's going on there. And I think I told some of you brothers at least about <clears throat> the man named Caleb Clements in Indiana who had a good conversation with this week. He seems to seems to uh, just just seem to have a good a heart set toward truth and it's come out of a lot of like all of us, I guess, discovered a lot of falsehoods and in professing Christianity and is looking for open doors to find some work out here in this area, so hopefully that could work out if it's God's will. Um, let's stand to pray. <clears throat> oh God in heaven, Holy is your name, and we pray that your kingdom would come, your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. We pray that you would give us this day our daily bread, forgive us of our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation. Uh, but deliver us from evil. We do pray, Lord, for uh, your blessing on this day as we come come together to worship. We pray that it could be uh, you could be in our midst, and it could be a a worship that is pleasing to you, and our hearts could be. Uh, either clean or cleansed. <clears throat> we pray, Lord, that you would convict us of all evil. <clears throat> Be with Brother Walter when he shares the main message and give him the words to speak that we all need to hear. Pray for Brother Aaron Whitley that this he could be healed from this sickness and and just pray you would keep him and your daughter in your care and as they seek you and guide him and direct him. We pray for Harvey and Walter Jr. and Adelmo. Keep them safe as they travel today. <clears throat> we pray for 
Brother Daniel Schneider in Bangladesh, Lord, keep him in your care too, and give him the strength, and energy, and uh, the mind and courage to serve you faithfully and be a good witness and light. Pray also for Caleb Clements in Indiana. Lord, we pray that you would be with him and, and fan the flame in him that he could grow. And if, it, if it's your will, Lord, that uh, we could fellowship more closely together, that you would open the doors for that to happen. Uh, we just pray for your blessing on this day. Yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. In Jesus' name, amen. There's a story in the book of Daniel uh, that's in the Septuagint, but not, not in the Masoretic text. It may be a new story for some of you if, if, uh, if, you're, not, if, you, if you're not familiar with the Septuagint. It's, it's an intriguing story. I think everybody down to the little children would find this story pretty, pretty intriguing. <clears throat> It's in chapter 12 of Daniel in the Septuagint. I'll start in verse 1. Uh, well, it's actually, I guess it's kind of a, just an add-on to, to Daniel. It starts with verse 1 without a chapter. Like it ends with chapter 12, then and, and then it starts with this bell and the serpent. It says, when King Astyges was gathered to his fathers, Cyprus of Persia received his kingdom. Daniel was a confidant of the king and was honored above all his friends. Now the Babylonians had an idol whose name was Bel. That's B-E-L. <clears throat> and every day they spent on it Twelve bushels of fine flour, forty sheep, and six vessels of wine. The king adored it and went every day to worship it. But Daniel worshipped his own god. So the king asked him, why do, you, why do you not worship Bel? Daniel answered, Because I do not worship idols made with hands, but only the living God who created heaven and earth and his dominion over all flesh. The king said, to him, do you not think Bel is a living God? Do you not see how much he eats and drinks every day? Daniel smiled and said, Do not be deceived, O king, for it is but clay inside and bronze outside, and it has never eaten and drunk anything. Very angry, the king summoned his priests and said to them, If you do not tell me who it is that consumes those provisions, you shall die. But if you can prove that Bel consumes them, then Daniel shall die, because he blasphemed against Bel. So Daniel said to the king, Let it be according to your word. Now there were seventy priests of Bel besides their wives and children, and the king went with Daniel into the temple. And the priests of Bel said, Look, we will step outside, you, O king, set out the food and prepare the wine, then shut the door and seal it with your signet. If you do not find Bell has eaten it at all, when you come tomorrow, we will suffer death. Or else Daniel shall die, who speaks lies against us. So, I, that, that's pretty clear, but just in case some of you children didn't catch what was going on here. So, so they had, the Babylonians had this, this temple... With, a, with an idol in it that they named Bel. And every day, they took 
12 bushels of fine flour. They, sl they slaughtered 40 sheep <clears throat> and took big six, six vessels of wine and set it inside the temple by this, by, this, by this idol. And then they closed the door and went outside. And by the next morning, this food was all gone. And everybody believed that this, this idol, this god, this bell ate this food. Even the king believed this. Daniel knew better. So they made this agreement that, that they would set it there. The king himself would lock the door. He would seal it in a way that nobody else can open it. And we'll see what happens <clears throat> to prove this thing. It says they, being the 70 priests, they were unconcerned for under the table they had made a secret entrance through which they always came in to consume the provisions. So when they had all gone, the king set out the food for Bel, and Daniel ordered his servants to bring in ashes, which they sprinkled throughout all the temple in the presence of the king alone. The priest did not know this was happening. Only Daniel and, and, and the king and the servants knew that they had scattered a whole bunch of ashes over the floor in this temple. <clears throat> then they went out, shut the door, sealed it with the king's signet, and departed. During the night, the priests came with their wives and children as they usually did and ate and drank everything. The king rose early the next morning and Daniel with him. Then the king said, Are the seals intact, Daniel? And Daniel answered, They are intact, O king. As soon as the doors were opened, the king looked at the table and cried out in a loud voice, Great are you, O bell, and with you there is no deceit at all. Then Daniel laughed and restrained the king from going in. He said, look at the floor and notice whose footprints are these. The king replied, I see the footprints of men and women and children. With great anger, the king seized the priest and their wives and children, and they showed him the hidden door where they came in and consumed such things as were upon the table. Therefore the king put them to death and handed Bel over to Daniel, who destroyed it and its temple. <clears throat> we kind of... <clears throat> we kind of laugh at the king and the people who were so ignorant and so superstitious that they would believe such a thing. Uh, I mean, we just... Something like that would be so far from us, we, we think it's funny. Daniel thought so, too. <clears throat> he laughed about it. But people are... I just, I just think people in general are... Easy, they love to be mystified... They're easily drawn to uh, mysteries and wonders and and superstitions and and things that things that are like oh how did this happen uh, and 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 these things are are that, that's why mystery novels are great people love them or um, <clears throat> those kind of things but. And and we think maybe maybe this kind of idolatry, this kind of superstition was for people who were like in the past, like people who were just ignorant, people who never learned how to read, never had an education. But things that go on in even professing Christian churches today are not all that different. Uh, they produce they produce things with with uh uh like first of all they, they there's there's um you could say there's science behind this or there's like they can they predict things and because of their suggestions and because of what they do like through hypnosis and 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 knowing how the mind works if if you play certain kinds of music with certain kinds of beats they can produce something out of the people that looks very mystical and it looks it looks like somebody prophesied what happened and it happened and and it was just produced by some mastermind behind it who knows how these things work and people are at awe 
and they're drawn to it. Or, or they, they, um, they uh, make, make gold dust and clouds. And, and after preaching some sermon out of the Old Testament, how God was in the cloud and this kind of thing, they, they, they make this smoky thing in their church houses and, and glitter, goldy glitter flies around and everybody is thinking God is moving greatly. And, and behind all this is just people who have produced this thing. And yet multitudes of people are, are drawn into it and they, uh, they're deceived by it. <clears throat> Again, we just shake our heads almost in disgust like, how, how can people do this? How can the people, how can people, how can the people who are sucked into it, be sucked into it, and how can the people who produce it be so, so bad? How can they be so deceptive? Knowingly. Some of them may not know what's going on even, but somebody does. <clears throat> but things even can come closer to, to home, like how, um, how, how can people who... <clears throat> How can people go through all the same motions and rituals of, of idol worshipers, but, but only do it to certain kinds of images or uh, certain kinds of icons, and, and, and they, they can bow to them, they can kiss them, they can speak to them, and, and yet somehow you can convince yourself that it's something different. It's, it's something different. It's some, some kind of veneration or... Uh, it's not. It's not worship. <clears throat> Again, we can shake our heads in disbelief and wonder, like, how can people do this thing? How can people, how can people do such a thing and not know what's going on? But I'd like to bring it even a little closer home. <clears throat> Inside of every one of us is this this heart, and. Jeremiah says the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <clears throat> There's, and we all have this, and we all best be very aware that, that this thing within us is not as trustworthy as we would like to think that it is. <clears throat> In fact, if scripture is true, it's deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. And it has a way of telling us something and convincing us something of something that has no substance. It has it's not the real thing. It's it's clay inside and bronze outside. Oh. Uh, it doesn't eat what we think it eats. <clears throat> Nothing is made a truth simply because our heart tells us so. And nothing is made a falsehood simply because our heart tells us so. You know, when other people judge us, they see our actions, they see our works, they see our fruits, and they judge it by that. And they may be right, or they could be wrong, because they don't, they don't, uh, see the very intentions and motives of the heart. They, if it's a discerning man, he, he, he's very likely right. He may be right, but he could be wrong. If we judge ourselves, we tend to judge ourselves by what our intentions were. Regardless of how it exactly worked out, like we knew what our intentions were, we thought our intentions were good, and, and we tend to judge ourselves by that. We may be right, but we may be wrong. Because that heart that tells us so is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? <clears throat> when God judges us, He judges rightly. He knows it better than we know it and anybody else. And that's why it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. The heart is that, it's that inner thing, like we have a we have a physical heart that pumps blood through all our body. And I, I don't know, like, 
when it talks about the heart, like when it talks about having having a new heart, or when it talks about uh, the heart being deceitful, I mean, I don't know what connection our actual heart has with it, if any. But 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 the reality is like deep deep things are often felt here in the chest like when you when you when, when you hear news that just is really heartbreaking like you feel this somewhere in here like there's this weight or when people say they're heartbroken it's because deep with in their deepest chamber here something just seems like it's apart it's not connected anymore when you're lighthearted you just you're breathing freely and you feel you feel that way I don't know, if any, what connection it has to the physical. But I just think that's why scripture, or what, why people would say like it's, it's a, it's a matter of the heart, is because it, they, they can, they can feel it here more than they can feel it here. Um, <clears throat> anyway, but but our body is a temple, right? Our body is a temple <clears throat> that Christ wants to dwell in. What what are what are perhaps some secret trap doors in our temple into our inner chamber where nobody else knows and we've we've succeeded in deceiving the crowds into thinking that it's not there and even ourselves into thinking that it's not there and what goes on in here is real when our deceitful heart has told us something other, or, or, or our deceitful heart is telling us something false, and we believe it. <clears throat> In what ways are we thinking that we are something that we are not? The, in the Pilgrim's Progress, ignorance was convinced. He, he was the one that didn't come through the gate. And through the cross, he, he jumped over the wall and he was headed on the same path as Christian and either hopeful or faithful at the time. And he was convinced he was on the right path because his heart told him so. <clears throat> and Christian tried to point out to him how his heart is deceitful above all things and that, that he, can't, he can't trust that. <clears throat> if we at home fuss and complain and scowl and scold and are angry until someone knocks on the door and we put a smile on our face and we talk cheerfully and act kindly and say nice things about our wife and children and which one is the real person and which one is a false person? <clears throat> when we talk about purity and modesty and the wickedness of lust and, and all the things pertaining to that until we are all alone on the internet at night or in the aisle of magazines all by ourselves, which one is the real us and which one's a fake <clears throat> If we praise God and we pray elaborately and we talk about scripture and we praise God when people are present until when we're all alone, none of this matters anymore to us. Which one is the real us? Which one is a false heart? <clears throat> if we act calm and peaceful and polite until people pressure us hard enough and then we erupt with angry words and retaliation. Which one was the real us? And which one was fake? <clears throat> if you take an orange, and it's a good orange, it doesn't matter how hard you squeeze it, only good juice comes out of it. And the harder you squeeze it, the better the juice. <clears throat> I have heard, and I... I say this cautiously. I, I don't know if it applies across the board every time. I actually say it fearfully because 
this could happen to me, it could happen to all of us, but I've heard that when people, when people either through a sickness or old age or something like lose their, <clears throat> lose their sound reasoning, and they, they, they had been a very nice person, very likable, very kind, very polite, did, did just very, very, uh, had seemed to have very good virtue, good, good virtuous heart, but then when they lose their, their reasoning, and they, on their hospital bed or deathbed, just become cranky and, 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 and hard, like saying all kinds of mean and bad things, like I've heard that that was the real heart. And all this other stuff was a pretense. <clears throat> it's frightful to think about. I think it could be true, and I, I, I say it like, Maybe brothers can share what they think about that if they want to, but uh, it is pretty easy for us to, to put up a false pretense. The psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts, and see if there be any wicked way in me, and lead me in the, past ever, in the ways of everlasting. You know, a lot of people like that verse. Um... It gets quoted a lot. But are we sure that it's not because we know that we should be saying that? We want people to hear that we say, search me, O God, and know my heart. I mean, what if we're really honest? Do we really want him to expose what's in there? Do we want him to, like, what if, what if he, what if he's going to do that? Right here in the presence of everybody, he's going to, he's going to expose what is in me, he's going to search me out and he's going to expose it. And it's going to be exposed. Do I still want to say that? Do I really want that? Or do I want people to think that I'm that open? That's how far this thing can come down of like, whether, whether something is really the real thing within us or whether we're putting up some kind of a fake <clears throat> I'm going to close here in Proverbs. <clears throat> There's a passage. Chapter 4. Starting in verse 19, he says, My son, <clears throat> give heed to my word and incline your ear to my words. Now, this is Solomon writing probably to his sons, but what I want you to think about is, I want you to think about this being God saying to his children, and he says, my son. This, this would be the following, the following words, I want you to think as if God was saying this to you if you're his children. My son, give heed to my word and incline your ear to my words that your fountains may not fail you. Guard them in your heart, for they are life, he's talking about his words, for they are life to those who find them and healing for all their flesh. Keep your heart with all watchfulness, for from these words are the issues of life. Put away from yourself a crooked mouth and remove unrighteous lips far from you. Let your eyes look straight up forward and let your eyelids ascent to righteous things. Make straight paths for your feet and direct your ways aright. Do not turn aside to the right or to the left, but turn your foot from an evil way. For God knows the ways of the right hand, but those of the left are perverse, and he shall make your path straight and guide your steps in peace. <clears throat> Paul said, he that thinks he stands must take heed lest he fall. And I don't think, like as we, as we would go about trying to expose falsehoods, if we were trying to expose what Daniel exposed to the king, a, a false god, uh, or if we were trying to expose some of these these falsehoods in the in the in the 
signs and wonders movement of our day or 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 whatever else <clears throat> like and coming down to like the personal things in our life I don't think the answer is that we need to get back to logic and reason and science. And if we can prove it with these things, it's real. If we can't, it's mysterious. No. God is a supernatural being. We, we can't, with those things, with, with science, logic, and reason, we can't figure out how Jesus walked on water, how Philip was caught up and carried to another city. All these things we can't figure out like that. But, I think this this may not be like a complete a complete list but as I was thinking about this this morning I was thinking if if we're going to if we're going to keep from being deceived and led astray we must keep the fear of God a love of truth and a humble heart and I I don't even know that one of those not accompanied with the others would safeguard us So let's uh let's do that. Let's keep let's keep his word, his words in our heart with all diligence for out of it are the issues of life. We'll open it up for comments. Yeah, I just was saying I'm glad to be here. I'm thankful for it. I'm thankful for the thought provoking lesson. Uh, a lot of a lot of good things to think about, especially about the deceitfulness of the heart and how we can beguile ourselves with feelings. I've, I've thought a lot about um, mental illness in general. It's interesting that in this, in this country that we live in and many other um, what we would call developed countries in the world, um, anytime somebody acts strangely, um, we give it a scientific name and and then give them medicine to deal with it. And uh, there is zero recognition of demonic activity and the spiritual realm. And then in some fundamental groups and circles, you have the opposite. And anytime somebody acts strangely, it has to be a demon. And it couldn't possibly be medical. And therefore... Um, the only thing we can do is pray for them and wonder maybe what they did to invite this demon into their life. I think that the reality probably is that it could be both. Um, the scripture talks about David feigning madness. Madness was a thing that could happen. And by that, I think what it means is mental illness. And there are also people in scripture that are demon-possessed. I think either extreme kind of ignores the possibility of the other. And I, I guess just thinking about as people age and they start to lose their, their ability to remember things, their ability to reason, certainly I think that if somebody gets grouchy or they get very, very sweet, that that could be who they really were. However, I would also submit that if the person has lost their ability to uh, tell a story that makes sense and comes full circle or they've lost their ability to remember events as they really were they forgot that they just said something and they say it again it would stand to reason that they would also lose their ability to discern between right and wrong um, we've all had to train ourselves in discernment according to the scriptures to train our conscience if you will so anyway, I, I just would say that I think both could be possible. That it could be the real crabby person that was always putting up a facade. And, and it could be that the person is just beyond reason anymore. And, and furthermore, I go out on a limb here. I would just say that I think God knows the difference. And I believe he's merciful to those who really have become somebody else. Um, anyway, I but I, I sure appreciate the the whole overall message of 
of our hearts being deceitful and trying to put fact before feeling. Amen. Gre greetings, everybody. I, I just want to say, um, well, amen to the what Brother Dwayne was was sharing. Um, I mean, I've been exposed. I, I, all of us, I think, if uh, you know, I just. I, I can't hide anything from my family and stuff. Um, but the thing is, it it should drive us to the Lord. And, and that's where the grace comes. I think if we're really... Um, and that's where the, the Lord is inviting us, come to me, you know. Um, you know, He's close with the broken heart. And He's really... That's where we ought to be uh, going anyway. It, to, to the Lord always, so that that He could. So uh, He's our He's our everything, and that's where that's the direction where we should be going all all the time. Anyway, thank you, Brother Dwayne. It was uh, <coughs> edifying as as all your lessons are. And appreciate your comments, Max and Glenn. And, uh, I agree that. Reason and logic, I think, are, are very important to be like the Bereans who studied. They searched the scriptures daily to see if they're so. I know this morning in my private devotion, I was reading about Matthias in the lot, and I was listening to both sides of the argument. Well, there's the lot for today, as some people from plain background use the lot when they determine who's going to be a minister or was it not. And I listened to both arguments, and I could convince one way. I said, oh, this definitely, I. I never listened to both sides of the argument completely, but it was a pretty good debate. It was in Daniel Kaufman's Doctrine of the Bible, his, he, about 100 years ago, who's a Mennonite bishop. And, you know, it, and I, I thought that it was a good uh, explanation, although he could be wrong, and I could be wrong for following the way I chose. But I think reason and logic have a lot to do with uh, certain things, especially like Bell and the Dragon. And... Uh, and I also agree with how Max said it. I mean, there are verses that say, Jude, he is able to keep you. And Paul says, I know whom I believe. And I'm, how does it go? I know whom I believe, and he is able to keep me to the end. And so when you lose your sanity, so I think, as I agree with Brother Dwayne, your heart of hearts will overcome. On the other hand, you have someone like John the Baptizer. Uh, you know, are, are you, is, is he the one it is or to come? He's, he definitely was losing his sanity. And, but he kept it. Are you the, he still was waiting for the Messiah. He still had that, that good heart, you know, the one to come and the truth. He didn't, you know, say, God has forsaken me. So I realized that, that John the Baptist was, uh, was not completely in control of his mental faculties at that time in prison. But I believe that, like Paul and Jude, that he is able to keep us until that day. The Lord be magnified. Yeah, I too just want to say amen. Um, I've had some of these same thoughts about, you know, how will I be if if the time would come that that I lose my mental facilities or whatever the way Dwayne was talking about. Anyway, um, I guess all that aside, I mean, if if I were. Uh, and all these other things he was talking about, I was thinking like I had this picture in my mind of an x-ray machine and how they use it to to uh, get a picture of your your bones what what if we had if we had an x-ray machine here that um, would shine through our heart and would expose all of our innermost thoughts and whatever's in there. Um, of course, we don't have such a thing. We'll never have. But there, there's a time coming when all these things will be brought to light on the final day of judgment. So it would behoove us to... Uh, let ourselves be searched, search our own hearts, and have the Lord search our hearts, and and uh, 
because they will be these things will be exposed in the end. Praise the Lord. Thank you for uh, your hospitality and having us here, and uh, appreciated the message. I think that in the end of the end, uh, the Bible says that the word of God is sharper than a two-edged sword, dividing asunder and. And is uh, the joint and how does it say it? The well, soul and the spirit from the, and the joint and the marrow. So it, it divides between spiritual and carnal. There it divides between spiritual and physical, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so, in the end, uh, um, I think we have to judge everything by the word of God.